Hi, everyone, and welcome to our event. I'm Jeffrey Cohen. I'm the Dean of Humanities here at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. We're so glad that you've joined us this evening for the first of our three Tomorrow Talks. Tomorrow Talks place thought leaders of today in conversation with the change makers of tomorrow, our ASU students. Each distinguished speaker will explain how they use writing to address our most pressing challenges. In addition to tonight's event, spring 2021 speakers include Melinda Gates on March 18th and Ayanna Thompson on April 15th. Tomorrow Talks are, student, are a student engagement initiative led by the Division of Humanities and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at ASU and hosted by ASU's Department of English and Center for the Study of Race and Democracy in partnership with Macmillan Publishers. Additional assistance is provided by ASU School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. These talks have an interesting genesis. Last fall, I asked Carl Jensen, the visionary director of our writing program, to think about innovative ways to keep our amazing ASU students engaged outside of class during the spring semester, and hopefully ways that would have impact on our larger community. We knew we'd be facing more months of social distancing and missing the community that the college experience brings. About 10 seconds later, Kyle was launching this program that begins tonight, a program that emphasizes our commitment to access and inclusion. I'm grateful to Kyle for making this happen. On to our talk. Complete, biblio complete biographies for Michael Eric Dyson and Lois Brown may be found online, but allow me to say a couple of brief words. Professor Dyson is Distinguished University Professor of African America and Diaspora Studies in the College of Arts and Sciences, of Ethics and Society, Divinity School, and Centennial Professor at Vanderbilt University. He's the author of seven New York Times bestsellers. His most recent book is Long Time Coming, Reckoning with Race in America. And if you have not read it, you should buy it right away. In fact, you want to after tonight. He ended a recent conversation with these words I'd like to share with you because they've been ringing in my ears since I read them. Reckoning doesn't have to be a colossal challenge sorry, reckoning does not have to be a colossal change all at once. There's everyday stuff that needs to be dealt with. Healthcare, the prison system, the justice system, everything that ends in the word system has to be re-examined. We have to be constantly and religiously revising and reviewing in order for us to make progress. Wow. Lois Brown, who will be our conversant tonight, is Foundation Professor of English and the Inspired Director of ASU Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, a center whose mission and whose challenge to our university community, in fact, to community, and in fact, to our national community has only grown under her leadership as a scholar, as a leader, as an activist. She makes our community here better every day. I pinch myself most days because I have the opportunity to work with her. And I hope I'm not launching this too soon, but she and I have a secret project called Operation Prevail that's going to change the world at some point, but you'll mm. learn more about that in time. I could go on forever about these two, but I know we're here to hear them converse. So over to Michael Eric Dyson and Lois Brown. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dean Cohen, for the warm words of welcome. And I want to echo that, Professor Tyson. Thank you for honoring us with your time and uh, your thoughts and your meditations this evening. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. And thank you, Dean, for those gracious words. So I wonder if we might start, uh, Professor Dyson, by thinking a little bit about how you came to Long Time Coming. You are an academic, you're a scholar, you're a writer, you're a minister. Um, and as one makes one's way through this book, it is a project of reclamation and in some ways a project of resurrection. Can you tell us a little bit about how this book came to be for you and for us? Yes. Well. First of all, what an honor it is to be in conversation with you, Professor Brown, one of the most distinguished 
uh, intellectuals, literary scholars, uh, PBS stars of documentaries, uh, and certainly of uh, uh, incredible books. You know, I was angered, grieved, uh, frustrated, and in some senses depressed um, about the turn of events, the kind of repetition compulsion in a socially pathological fashion to 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 pinch a, a Freudian term and then deploy it out of context for my purposes. But here we go again. Um, when I saw the George Floyd video, I thought to myself, haven't we literally seen this movie before? Hasn't a documentary of the demise of Eric Garner not played across our digital media scape? Have we not heard the words literally, I can't breathe, what was it, 11 times by Mr. Garner seven years ago or thereabouts? And so we know in, um, you know, the, the, the cinema of race in America, there are often sequels, names may change, but the essential character that unfolds, the, the, of the drama that unfolds remains the same. And it was dispiriting, it was disconcerting to see a man laying prostrate on the ground, begging of the policeman who continued to bore his knee into this man's mortally depressed column with a kind of casual disregard, a, 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 an explosive and yet um, contained sadism that said this life doesn't matter, black lives don't matter, I am not concerned about my fate because if the wanton disregard for black life doesn't effectively dismiss any potential charge against me, then qualified immunity that element of the Constitution that says an agent of the state cannot be held to personal account for even a lethal gesture in the name of the government that employs him or her will save me. And so it was depressing and disconcerting, just as it is, Professor Brown, when I look at what happened in Houston the other day with a young black man walking, minding his own business. And he's answering the questions, maybe not the way you want them to, but he's answering your questions. He's clearly trying to get home. He has no jacket on. It's cold outside. He's making his way home. And yet he is interrupted for no good reason. And so the events of May 25th, and then the next day we also saw um, what happened in Central Park with Cooper versus Cooper, Amy versus Christian, and uh, a white woman claiming that this black man had accosted her, had assaulted her, had potentially, you know, hurt, harmed her and threatened her. All lies. We didn't know until recently she made a second call saying he was threatening her, right? After the police had come and said, this is a private matter, it seems y'all have worked it out. It got put on, like Mr. Floyd's death, on, on recording and then distributed across the digital landscape. And she lost her job, her public dignity, 
but the caroning of black people was once again highlighted. So those events just uh, thrust me, along with Ahmaud Arbery's death, being hunted down like an animal, um, made me say enough is enough. And in an earlier book, uh, Tears We Cannot Stop, A Sermon to White America, it was the depths of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile after I had literally just finished that night my uh, book on President Obama. I stayed up all night writing an op-ed that got a lot of notice that turned into Tears We Cannot Stop about this. And so I was like, not again. Here we are once again confronting this unenviable um, explosion of racial animus against the black body that continues to be vulnerable to police rebuff brutality, and now it appears murder. So that's what kind of got me started on my path of writing this book. And you know, as you as you were talking, I was thinking about the the individuals to whom you are writing. And part of the um, intervention that you make in talking about and writing to Breonna Taylor and Sandra Bland in particular is that you address sites of murder, sites S-I-T-E-S and sites S-I-G-H-T-S mm -hmm. that we do not see. And so the deaths of Black women at the hands of law enforcement versus the deaths that we are playing out here, the vigilantism. Can you talk about the ways in which you imagine these letters as acts of um, narrative justice, because you went into scenes that none of us could see. And that was part of the tragedy. Wow, uh, such a brilliant uh, formulation. Yes, to, to, first of all, I did want to rescue and redeem the intimate violence to which black women, among others, are subject, and the erasure from the narrative cycle of black female bodies because their bodies are not usually publicly menaced to the point of fatality. Slung around, we've seen it. Uh, you know, a young black girl pulled by her braids, 15 years old, I believe. Uh, maybe in Texas or, or uh, and Florida. and Florida, yes, mm -hmm. Florida, and then a nine-year-old girl tasered. We've seen that. Um, we've seen a black girl thrown to the floor in her seat in school. But the ultimate gesture of life taking is not usually recorded in the same way uh, that black men's. Uh, lives, those pornographic snuff films of the last moments of a Black life, as it literally ekes out of the body and escapes the lungs. Um, but similar to the sights, as you, you know, played on that in a in a, in a very punny way, but also a double entendre, a signifying fashion, that that black people who have to go to a crack house are more likely to get caught because the physical geography of their addiction or attraction puts them at decided disadvantage because of the economic inequality that forces them to buy crack cocaine at $25 a hit versus richer, usually whiter people who can consume cocaine in the privacy of their offices so that the physical geography itself, the site of the uh, offense um, means that racial inequality reinforces the vulnerability of black peoples who are more likely to be surveilled by police who are looking at houses that are identified as crack houses or houses of, quote, ill repute versus the well-manicured, cleansed spaces, the white space of the elite. Similar to that, Black women 
are not physically assaulted in public in ways because of stature, because of the threat that black men may be perceived to present in a patriarchal culture, one patriarch against another patriarch, mano y mano. So there's a kind of testosterone, a a testosterone centric (laughs) and a kind of toxic masculinity at play in the identification of the particular threat of black masculinity, it doesn't mean that black women are not equally opprobrious in other means, in other sites. It means that their bodies are usually snuffed, taken, assaulted, beaten, uh, malevolently uh, discarded, and ultimately disposed of in more private spaces because of the shame that might occur by visibly assaulting a black woman in a way, in a patriarchal measure and metric where it's not an equal fight. Though, I must quickly add, in terms of physical assault, black women are always an asterisk and an exception. Pummeling us, pregnant women beat on the ground physically. So I'm talking about the ultimate gesture of murder uh, or life-taking. So I did want to not punish black women because they are doubly invisible, Mm -hmm. invisible in the political economy of sight, in a dominant culture that refuses to see them, and then the refusal to visibilize black female suffering, even within the moral arc and the ethical trajectory of black resistance itself, Mm -hmm. right? Until quite recently, when Black Lives Matter, founded by two queer women and a straight black woman, have put on foot front street terminologically and structurally, and in terms of origin story, the myth can't escape (laughs) the very bodies in which it was created and formed, in which it was birthed, the womb of Black Lives Matter, uh, in ironically and paradoxically, in the womb of two queer women, that will not be impregnated by the literal or metaphysical seminal structure of an exclusively black masculine prerogative. That's that's God being a genius right there. But so for me, um, it it, it, it was a a kind of narrative justice to say we got to uh, pay attention and restore to. So Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, Hadia Pendleton, I wanted to make sure their bodies were front and center, that their faces were as as famous as Breonna Taylor's is uh, by now, but Sandra Bland's uh, and then Hadia Pendleton's to make sure that their faces were seen. And so I wrote letters. I didn't want to write about them. I wanted to write to them. I mean, I discuss them. I write about what happened to them and and the things we have to do to negotiate uh, the racial Uh, tensions in our culture, but I wanted to write to them. Like you go visit your your folk at the graveyard. You know they ain't there, but they're there to hear you. You evoke them. You conjure them. You feel a space of intimate spiritual kinship and connection because that spiritual space means that even though their physical bodies are not there, they provide you the opportunity to reflect and think out loud or to yourself about what you're experiencing and help clarify it. So in that sense, I wanted to have an epistolary form that would tie me uh, to the intimate interactions with recently arrived ancestors and mostly um, recent, uh, you know, martyrs so that I could have a conversation that might be meaningful to us as a people and hopefully to the nation. I wonder, sir, if there was anybody to whom you could not write, to whom Mm. you began a letter that you could not finish or could not even begin. Hmm. Yeah. I wrote it, but that letter to Elijah McClain is so painful. A young man, perhaps, 
on the spectrum, 23 years old. His co-workers said he walked as if a gold orb surrounded him. He played the violin to soothe the birds. And when he was walking home one night outside of Denver in Aurora, Colorado, and I know I'm not technically answering your question, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm saying how difficult it was to, to pen that letter B, and I wrote it last. Because this baby, this child, this sweet young man, was walking home. And a white person, no doubt, not meaning any harm, but my pastor used to say, a mosquito doesn't mean you any harm either, but it just wants a little blood, but it could give you malaria and kill you. So intent doesn't exhaust consequence. Right? We don't have to be, you know, profound literary theorists on the Hersheyan model to talk about the politics of interpretation or authorial intentionality, Foucault or Derrida for that matter, or maybe even Du Bois or Bell Hooks. But the point is that he was walking home and the white person calling, I wish white people sometime just don't do it. Not because you don't mean well, not because you are malevolent or malicious, but because you can't account for the unpredictable hurt and pain and trauma that many white cops impose on black life for no reason that you could ever imagine. Walter Scott, it was, it was a left turn signal. But when he was stopped in South Carolina, he got out of his car and ran because he thought that the cop knew that he owed child support and he was delinquent. Then the cop withdrew his gun from his holster and shot that poor man in his back seven times. Sandra Bland, a traffic stop that should never have occasioned the traumatic interaction between her and the law enforcement. And because she was uppity, because she spoke for herself, because she articulated clearly and denunciated lucidly from the grammar of her social resistance and her political self-care. Fighting with a policeman who should have never harangued her. And two days later, because she can't make bail, she's hanging in her jail cell dead. So when, when, when white people call the police, just think that, that because the person said, it's probably nothing, then don't. Because white cops do things to black people and bodies that they don't do to white bodies routinely. And so he had a full face mask on pre-COVID because he was anemic. And he told them, I am different. What does he have to do? Write a volume that completes though he didn't think it was incomplete. Martin Heidegger's Dasein? Does it have to be an, a, a kind of ontology where he gets into the depth of black being? He has to explain to them, I am a human being. When they approached him, what did he say? Please respect the boundaries that I am speaking. First of all, Professor Brown could do a kind of literary analysis of that kind of homespun eloquence. Please respect the boundaries that I am speaking. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. The word as the creative principle. The nomos, 
or the gnosis, right? And so he's, he, he begged them, these big, hulking, bigger than him police people. And they rendered him unconscious twice. Five foot six. And 147 pounds. Maybe not even. And I'll tell you what hurt my heart is listening to him plead for his life in every imaginable way he could. Hey, I would you mind if I read that? I, I'm sorry. I just Ooh, want it, people it to be, hear. Would be I just want you to hear, and, and I'm not. I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I just want you to hear what this, this young man said. He, uh, he said he was different. He's, I'm different, he said, right? Because you did things like play the violin to sue stray cats. Oh, I said bird, sorry. Your coworker said you wanted to walk, you, you seemed to walk with a gold orb around you. Someone called the cops on you saying you appeared suspicious, right? I am an introvert. Please respect the boundaries that I am speaking. You told them you were on your way home and asked them to stop being so aggressive. The interaction quickly escalated as you, all of five feet, six inches and 140 pounds, tried to speak to the cops and they refused to listen. They applied a, uh, a carotid, carotid hole to limit the blow, blood flow to your brain. What in the name of God would promote such a vicious and aggressive intervention that you feared a black boy at 5'6", 140 pounds, as he pleaded with you? You could tell he was different. You know he wasn't the normal uh, black person that you might, in your own stereotypical vision, a confront, he has no potential to hurt or harm you. And then he says, uh, rendering him temporarily unconscious. And when the Aurora Fire Rescue arrived, they administered ketamine to you in an effort to sedate you, which in combination with the trauma you endured was enough to eventually kill you. He said, I can't breathe. He said, I, I, don't, I don't even... He says, I, I have no gun. I don't do that stuff. You promise. I don't do any fighting. Then you pleaded, why are you attacking me? I don't even kill flies. I don't even, I don't eat meat as if your penchant for peacefulness and your dietary discipline might somehow convince them that your life was worth sparing. But Elijah, you quickly insisted that you didn't have a sense of moral superiority over those who disagree with your choice. But I don't judge people who do eat meat. You beg them to forgive you. It goes on. All I can do is write. It hurt the because, power. Because I, I'm sorry, I just want to say because, and I'm sorry, I haven't done this before, so forgive me for this, but it it is it is. It is inhuman to routinely do to black people what so many, too many cops do to us. And when we talk about the politics of respectability, mm -hmm. and then we wonder why we have engaged it, right? We read Evelyn Higginbotham's Righteous Discontent and we understand its historical context, but the point is we're trying to tell wife, hey, don't, you don't have to worry about me. I got the right suit. I got the right idea. I got the right ID. I've got the right deportment. And it doesn't matter because the, the ultimate paradox of the politics of respectability is we're trying to convince people who have seen us as animals that we are not. And so that, that was difficult. And please forgive me for, uh, for that. That, 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 was, yeah, that, was, that was difficult to write. Yeah. We have a question from an audience member that 
packs into what you've been talking about. And this is from George who says, it appears that whiteness and blackness need each other to exist. However, the quote balance only exists when blackness is subordinate to whiteness. But when jostled imbalance appears to create existential problems in both races, how can we deal with this problem? Because you've talked about that tangled dance, right? Mm -hmm. the, the tangle of blackness yep. and whiteness. Yeah, the symbiotic relationship between the two, right? Whiteness calls a certain kind of blackness into existence because blackness underscores a kind of whiteness and helps to create it, right? It, they're mutually uh, creative in, in a way, right? Because all of the ethnicities within African continental identity don't consider themselves black before coming to a place where blackness makes a difference, right? And Italians, Jews, Poles, Irish, Lithuanian, in Eastern and Western Europe, you come to, for instance, a place like this, and we remember what James Baldwin said in 1963, that, that race is a political fiction. So, yeah, we're fiction writers. Blackness, you know, African identity, underscored European identity. Think about it, even before slavery, when those travel logs are being written and all these travel narratives, that's how white males got on. That's how they got famous, you know, looking for some shine. Like, let me write a travel log, you know, as I went upon the sea. <laughs> that way lies tears. So... They go checking out stuff, and then they come to Africa, and then they begin to say their dances are different, their, their singing is different. The ritualistic, the rhythm of rituals that constitute African identity are different than our European conception. So they demonized us from the start. They tried to connect our dance to promiscuity and to intellectual and aesthetic inferiority. So from the very beginning, Europeans, not white, as we would say, creating Africans, not black, as we would say, as a tertium quid, a third thing. And now, right, they get, this is the, this begins the construction of blackness, inferior, subordinate, promiscuous. Black women are dancing, trying to seduce us. Their culture is not up to snuff. You can see Elements of this in Thomas Jefferson's Notes on Virginia, where he's remonstrating against the Negro for lack of rational superiority and technical facility, that is, during the day. Because we all know that at night he got some Luther Vandross tapes. And, you know, don't you remember? I told you I loved you, Sally. Yep. And all the people, it was amazing to me, how could that be? How could Thomas Jefferson engage in sexual congress with an enslaved woman? Are, are you kidding? Like, like for real? Like, y'all don't know that's what happens all the time every day? So whiteness literally depends upon blackness because blackness is the instrument and technology of the white imagination. Black limbs are creating what white minds seek to imagine. And then in the crucible of the white imagination, as George Fredrickson would say, and Winthrop Jordan would say, blackness is fashioned and hammered out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a mutually creative spot, but that jostling that you mentioned, beautiful terminology there, um, is interesting, and the burden falls on black people because black people are the only ones who end up being black in the eyes of white folk and themselves, while white folk, uh, you know, for the most part, don't think of themselves as white. That's been the issue, right? Because whiteness is the default position of American identity, identity collectively. White brothers and sisters don't have to be consciously white in order to be American. And in fact, their whiteness is subsumed under the rubric of Americanness. 
so that the default position of whiteness, of American identity, is whiteness, but it doesn't have to be explicitly articulated. So when white folks say, why don't you black people stop always talking about race and stop, just be American, what they mean is be white the way we are and don't interrupt the narrative. So yes, there is a jostling back and forth. There's a bruising interaction. You know, we read Ann Douglas in the 1920s about what happened in Harlem and blacks and whites making the world together or the world that the enslavers, Eugene Genovese and, and, the, and the slaves made together. Oh, we were, we were contributing even when we didn't get no copyright or no compensation. We were making this nation. So in that sense, yes, and the burden falls on us because we are blacked in a way that white folk are not whited out uh, in, in this culture. Yeah. So we have some students with us this evening who have questions for you. And certainly in thinking about the power of writing in the 21st century and the next generation who are gonna bear witness and be inspired by your works. So I want to, uh, to invite Phoenix uh, to offer a question. Hi. Hello. Um, I just had a question um, about in your book um, about your use of capitalizing the B in black and brown in the I in indigenous, but you never capitalized the W in white. And I was just wondering um, about why you decided to do that and how long you've been doing that too. Um, and if that ever caused any publishing issues or anything like that. <laughs> that's, that's a great question, Phoenix. I would say the dean of your school instructed me to do so, but I wrote the book before <laughs> I came in contact with him because I like that guy. He's just a nice, nice guy. And Brother Jensen, I could blame him because I've known him a, a, a far piece back, but I really can't blame him. So I'm going to have to take responsibility myself. That's a great question. You, you, you ever hear people ask why there's no White History Month? Yes. So, so the thing is, is that, you know, people tartly retort, well, heck, every other month is White History Month, right? So the reason we capitalize indigenous, or black and brown, is because there's already an implicit capital to whiteness. And whiteness is so cold, so good, so great that even when it has a small W, it, it, it aspires to capital status, <laughs> right? Even when it's small, a W, even when it's uh, written um, uh, without its capital, it ain't got no need to be capital. When, when LeBron James walk on the court, you ain't got to now see the greatest. My ball playing is going to let you know what I am, right? No disrespect to any ASU uh, alums. So the thing is, is that some things don't need to be said or marked because as I was trying to say earlier, their very invisibility encapsulates their dominance and their standardization, right? So now the Washington Post, I think capitalizes white too. Ah, no, 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 you're not gonna get away with it. We're gonna do the white too. We're gonna all be equal. And I can dig it, but here's the problem with that. If you're gonna make it all equal, if you're going to have a false equivalency between all names, indigenous, black, brown, and white, then that would presuppose that you got to make everything equal then, not just the capital letters, not just the grammar, not just the sentences in which they are contained, the paragraphs in which they appear on the page, or the books. What about capital? <laughs> right? Not, not, not capital W, but what about cash? Cash rules everything around me. Got to get the do dollar dollar bill, y'all. What about substance? What about material? What about reparation? If you want us to give you everything we got, give us everything you got, right? So that the give and take is never seen as a kind of critical uh, recognition that these are symbolic gestures to be certain, but they are the attempts to have a kind of grammatical reparation. Can we, can we call it that? Can we call it grammatical reparation? <laughs> like, like, like we get in the capital B because you have been denouncing us from the get go and disrespecting us and treating us horribly. And the more technical reason, of course, is that 
that American has seen has been seen to exhaust all ethnicities and so on. We know, you know, ostensibly, supposedly, we're all supposed to be contained in that, but that black people were the only, you know, were among, you know, some of the few people on earth, right? When you said black, that's not African American, that's not Haitian American. Haitian is capitalized. Irish American, I is capitalized, right? So we could say, well, you have African American, yeah, but what about those black people who ain't from Af- who ain't uh, African American, right? Or who are Africans in America, or who are Haitian or Caribbean? Are you going to call them North American, right? So the thing is, is that it's a way of acknowledging a kind of liturgy of ethnicity. What the heck does that mean? It, it it's a way of trying to say that we're going we're gonna to put them on the same grounds in terms of how you spell the name grammatically, in terms of the rules uh, of, of, of English grammar to try to recognize uh, a historic legacy that deprived them of an identification with a particular land or a, a particular continent or the ways in which the, the wiping out of their identities has gone on and it's gone on through the process of language itself. Now, Dr. Brown could explain a lot better than me, but those are the two reasons why. And how long have I been doing it? Uh, for a few years now. And look, I can go back and forth. Most of my other books didn't have the capital B. You know, I hate when people get woke and act like they've been woke for, uh, forever. Yes, you know, the transphobia. You didn't even know that term two years ago. Shut up. Okay, stop. You didn't even know that. You know, when we say uh, cisgender, like, like, bruh, like, I've been here for a minute. We weren't saying cisgender five years ago. At least I wasn't. Now, I'm sure Dr. Brown was, but but I, I wasn't saying cisgender, right? Heteronormativity. Huh? Huh? What? We didn't know that. Because we've come to be aware of the ways in which our languages harbor certain biases that we don't even intend, but that the language is a carrier for, right? We unload our language on the train of language, and then we allow it to carry the burden. And then we are seen as free. So those are some of the reasons why. And uh, I've been doing it for a little bit. It feels kind of good. First, I was like, yeah, yeah. I was like, yo, yo, I, I could, yo, I could be capital B. You understand B? You know what I'm saying? All right. So that's, I think that's why it happens. Okay. Thank you so much, Phoenix. I want to turn to Lindsay. You have a question for Professor Dyson. All right, Elena, you are with us. So while Lindsay's on her way, we'll take your question. Elena? Hello. Um, my question was, as a future educator who grew up in a school that had minimal people of color and other minorities, uh, these students were often singled out and isolated when talking about racism and its history. So I wanted to know, how do you recommend talking about difficult topics in the classroom, such as racial justice, while remaining sensitive to the students who belong to those communities? Yeah, that's another great question, uh, Miss Elena. Um, it, it's not it's not easy, right? Because even when we talk about now, you know, I was just talking to Miss Phoenix about how we learn new new terms, right? So two years ago, you'd have called me, I was saying minority people. Now we, we're taught to say minoritize, right? Why? Because because we are making them a minority, seeing them that way, but really they're two thirds of the world when it, when it comes to people of color, right? So that's something I just learned. I'm not even talking about you. I'm just talking about what I just learned. I was like, yo, and I've been doing this for a minute, right? So when you look at those people and, and, and you, as you beautifully say, how do, you, how do you not reinforce their isolation? Hey, you black person, what do you think? What do black people think? Yo, man, I, you know, I, <laughs> I know what I think. I know what a lot of black people think, right? But to have the burden of representation, as James Baldwin talked about it, uh, as a student, is uh, more than a bit unfair. And I think that, however... Uh, the impulse to try to address these issues is a good one. It's a powerful one. And in the right kind of classroom where people are discussing openly and honestly uh, what their perspectives are, what their histories have been, um, what minoritized people, what racialized people have been, and how they've been perceived, there's no question 
that it's extremely difficult, but necessary if we're going to have any progress. And I think one of the ways we do that is to invite people who are minoritized and racialized, hey, what do you feel? How do you think about that? How do you think about being called on? And how do I, as a white person or a non-black person or a non-person of color, imagine what it might be to be in that space, right? Because imagine, you know, I talk to some white people, they go, well, I, I went to the black church, you know, and Jesus, it was the first time I was a minority. <laughs> it's the first time I felt that, right? I, I recommend all white brothers and sisters, go places where you ain't in the majority. Now, that ain't going to give you a necessarily a life-changing experience, but it might give you a hint about your nervousness, wondering if you're accepted or not, whether people dig you or not, whether your diction is seen as the right thing, whether you're being made fun of. And then all the questions you generate, imagine what people have to routinely face those situations without recognition. So your point of recognizing it means put it on the table, be open and honest about it, talk about the fact that we have historically uh, excluded certain viewpoints, understandings, expressions, and peoples and that we must take the responsibility. Let's not put it on the black person. Let's not put it on the female. Let's not put it on the Asian, right? Let's put it on ourselves to be more curious and understanding. And the reason I say that, but let me tell you this. So I was writing this essay today on reparations. And you know what I came up with? I said, Dad Gummit, you know, when white white folks say, What's enough? What are we gonna do? Hey, I ain't I ain't got the answer, but I'll tell you what. Be as ingenious about helping us as you were hurting us, right? Be as ingenious. You, Jim Crow is pretty, is pretty petty. Nah, 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 nah. I got a white water fountain. You got a black water fountain. I mean, it's kind of adolescent, right? The stuff on buses, you know, the cotton curtain of apartheid, black people over here, white people over there. You know, be as ingenious about uplift and assistance as you've been in terms of hurting people and harming them. And then use that same imagination to work our way forward. And so I feel confident that majoritarian uh, folk in the culture, people who are in the dominant society, people who are white, people who are non-people of color, BIPOC, not, you know, black or indigenous or people of color, I think that once unleashed on these fields of uh, curiosity can come up with a lot of helpful things. But reading, thinking, talking to other people of color, you know, I, I know I don't want to put any more burden that I know already exists for uh, Professor Brown, because I'm sure she gets students who ain't even in her class. People probably don't even go to ASU. <laughs> You're writing her and talking to her because she is that powerful and that brilliant. Um, but, you know, if you have more than one black friend, more than three black friends, more than four, you know, native people, more than three Mexican, more than Chicago, right? And then you have a community and a network, you have a thicker um, affiliation that allows you to comfortably and reasonably and safely ask questions without fearing you'll be um, yourself excommunicated, and then you can imagine what those people feel, and then you present to them as opposed to querying them. What I've read, what I've seen, what I've heard, it may not be your story, it may not be your particular narrative, but this is what James Baldwin said it felt like. This is what Ralph Ellison said it felt like. This is what Toni Morrison talked about in playing in, playing in the dark. And then when you bring that wealth of knowledge to bear, it lets me know as a person of color, oh, you're curious. You've been curious enough to read because a lot of this information is readily available and you've, you've availed yourself of it. And now we can have a rich conversation. I hope I didn't over answer that, but I think that's a powerful, powerful question that you asked there. That was great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks Thank so you. much, Elena. Um, I want to turn now to um, Shelby, if you would. All right, it looks like we might be having a technical moment here. We're going to work to bring back Professor Dyson, so just bear with us. Here we go. All right, welcome back, sir. <laughs> and if you would, unmute yourself, got, Professor yeah. Dyson. I got put out there. I don't know what happened. I was like, the right, dean, well, I, 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 
Christine, I thought you loved me. <laughs> Welcome back. So we have Shelby, a student here at ASU, who'd like to pose a question of you. All right, Shelby. Yeah, hi. Um, my question, what was the desired effect of formatting the book as letters, and how did you decide which issues to address in each letter? Like, for example, when you address Breonna Taylor, you talk about status quo with the black next and the white again. So is there, um, does the reader make a connection between those two or? Oh, it's a great question. And I, I know that, uh, and I apologize to Professor Brown because I know she had so many more questions and I got touched by the spirit, so to speak. And um, I apologize for that, but uh, it, uh, it, it, it got to me tonight in a way it hadn't before. That's a great question. Um, you know, I chose the letter form because I wanted to connect with people. I wanted to connect with, even metaphysically, symbolically, with the people that I was writing to, right? Emmett Till, um, Eric Garner, and the people I was even writing about in those letters, like Ahmaud Arbery, and uh, as you said, writing to Breonna Taylor, I chose them based upon the story I wanted to tell, right? With Breonna Taylor, I wanted to talk about white theft of black bodies in enslavement. And so I start the chapter that way, but then I come to her because her life was stolen. It's a metaphor for our lives being stolen. The thievery, the theft of black existence, the theft of black futures, the stealing of black bodies was more than merchandise and material. It was spiritual and symbolic. You know, women were raped, culture was raped, black men castrated, lynched, women too, children uh, killed, beaten. Um, it was horrendous. Lives stolen, futures stolen. So I want to speak about that in a certain way. Sandra Bland, I wanted to talk about comfort because she interrupted that white cop's comfort level and really got inside of his brain in a way. And I wanted to talk about that. So each chapter, right, Emmett Till, I wanted to speak about black death and how it occurred in a certain fashion to young black people who were lynched or with Eric Garner, and then, of course, uh, about George Floyd, I wanted to speak about police brutality. So the black next and the white again, I'm glad you brought that up, in the chapter on, I think it's a Breonna Taylor. Um, what I meant there is that black people are constantly looking for the next thing, right? One of the key words in black culture is next. Still the blues. Well, before that, we had the spirituals. Then the next thing we invented, right, was the blues or the next thing we might, well, gospel, we might have invented the blues. We might invent, you know, jazz. We invent rock and roll. We invent uh, rhythm and blues. We invent uh, funk, soul, and hip hop. Some of that stuff gets appropriated. Some of it gets stolen. Uh, but it's still identified primarily with us. So it's the black next, and in terms of the next form of rebellion, the next form of resistance, the next form of challenge, the next way we come at, um, in a very serious fashion, some of the hostility and animus that might generate, um, that might be generated in dominant culture. How do we talk about that? How do we grapple with that? So black next against the white again. In slavery, let's have that again. Post-Reconstruction denial of opportunity, let's have that again. Jim Crow, let's have that again. Apartheid, let's have that again. From Confederacy, let's have that again, right? Southern rules and Northern ones for that matter, de jure and de facto, let's have it again. Let's make America great again. Is riffing off of that theme of the white again, constantly asserting what we will do once again to keep you under control, once again to keep you in your place, once again to remind you of your inferiority, once again to remind you that this nation does not belong to you. So I definitely wanted to speak about that and to characterize it in such a fashion that it was lucid, clear, and uh, plain to folks so they could uh, get a taste of that conflict 
in black and white Americas and figure out uh, in that conflict, you know, some of the joyous expressions of culture among black people and some of the pain and hostility that they've had to confront. And when we look at the white again, how can we miss that in regard to Janu January 6th of this year when a lot of white brothers and sisters took to the, to the, to the Capitol and tried to assert again that this you know, election has been stolen, that again it belongs to a certain group of people. You know, Black Lives Matter, Black Next, white, you know, resistance and rebellion and insurrection, white again. That's what I wanted to try to characterize there. Great. Thank you, Professor Dyson. We have two um, uh, more students to pose questions, and then we'll bring our program in to land. Uh, so, Jay, if you would, pose your question of Dr. Dyson. Good evening, Dr. Dyson. First of all, from the bottom of my heart and soul, I want to say thank you for coming out and talking to us tonight. It's been absolutely fantastic to listen to you, um, you. for the past period of time. But I wanted to ask, um, in long time coming, you note that with alarming regularity, Black folks are often vilified for, quote, making a dollar out of 15 cents. In theory, in my head, this sounds exactly like the American dream. But what makes the American collective ethos so eager to qualify, quote, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps as a positive ideal to embody when it applies to white Americans, but are less than enthused when they hear someone like Tupac rapping it? Is being Black so inherently un-American that they could not possibly embody American ideals? Man, I'm trying to get a job at ASU because y'all got the smartest students. Don't tell the Vanderbilt <laughs> Don't tell the Vanderbilt students I said. Yeah, the students are brilliant. You think? Oh my God! You got brilliant professor, brilliant dean, brilliant gents. I mean, my God, what a question! Like they all have been extraordinary, really. Um, no, it's a great point. It does make a difference: the shade, the shine, the skin, uh, the packaging, the perspective that is interpreted as a result of that, so that when a Pulitzer Prize winning historian um, made the argument that the center of American society derives its energy and the basic motif of American society gets its, you know, support from the notion of hustle. What? Oh, whoa! I mean, when the rim is in the system, ain't no telling will I love them, will I diss them. That's what they be yelling, I'm a pimp by blood, not relay Sean. Y'all still chase some? I'll replay some, huh? You know that. Jay quoting Biggie, right? I'm a hustler, baby, <laughs> right? Hustling is the central motif of Jay-Z's career. He's been speaking about hustling from the get-go, right? Can't knock the hustle. And so a major American conservative historian makes the argument that Jay-Z makes uh, in 13, 14 albums. Now, I'm not trying to parallel a Pulitzer Prize winning historian who deals with sources and careful analysis of original sources uh, to make an argument of interpretation of the central motif of American society driven by vast reaches of erudition versus a hip hop artist who is making an album. But that hip hop artist has deeply delved into the collective unconscious of a nation and on his own. He ain't go to Harvard. He ain't go to Yale. He ain't been to ASU. He ain't been to Vanderbilt. He, he ain't even graduated from high school. Nas, Nasir Jones, eighth grade dropout. It's only right that I was born to use mics and the stuff that I write it's even tougher than dice. I'm taking rapping to a new plateau through rap slow. My rhyming is a vitamin hell without a capsule. A smooth criminal on beat breaks. Never put me in your box if your stuff eats tapes. Man, that's the raison d'etre of hip hop philosophy. 
Here's a philosophical argument about the reason for his literacy. So that could be Walt Whitman. That could be Rita Dove, Joseph Kamenyaku. I mean, so the thing is, is that, yeah, there's often a discounting of black intelligence, just as there was a discounting of black humanity. Even Phyllis Wheatley, right? The great poet. What did Thomas Jefferson et al. say? Well, the moment you can master Greek, then you are highly intelligent and capable. She came along and they were like, uh, but what had, what had happened was, <laughs> then the asterisk come. We have yeah, but, but it's not the Greek, that, right? Then you fill in the blank, right? Um, when you think about romance novels and using them for as the backdrop to explicate and elucidate social drama, you know, turn to Professor Brown and ask her about Pauline Hopkins. And, and then you understand that black literacy has been disrespected and disregarded from the get-go. And yes, so that's what people with degrees, that's what people with acknowledged high eloquence. Imagine people who ain't got nothing, who don't possess any of that, how they will get disrespected. But like you're quoting Tupac, right? Trying to make a dollar out of 15 cent. Um... Just the other day, I got lynched by some crooked cops, he says. Just the other day, I got lynched by some crooked cops until this day. Them same cops on the beat getting major pay. But when I get my check, they taking tax out. So we paying the cops to knock the blacks out. You ain't got to be Marxist, you know, a, a theoretician. That, that's Marxism 101. That's economics. You're subsidizing your own oppression. Mm -hmm. Right? What Biggie said, back in the days, our parents used to take care of us. Look at them now. They're even scared of us, calling the state for help because they may, can't maintain damn things unchanged. If I wasn't in the rap game, I'd probably have a key, a kilo, knee deep in the crack game because the streets is a shortstop. Either you're slinging crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot. Damn, it's hard being young from the slums, eating fast and gums, not knowing where your meal's coming from. What happened to the summertime cookout every time I turn around, a brother's being took out. So shrinking spaces of recreation create the necessity of generating self-directed activity in a recreational space that also allows the propagation of the political economy of crack. All right there. So yeah, sometimes the packaging, the pigment, and the, the culture pre precludes people from understanding just how nice, just how ill, just how remarkable we are. So Jay Romero, you nice with your questions, you nice with your articulation and your expression, and I appreciate you so much, brother. As all of the questioners have been incredible, just incredible. Thank you so much. I really appreciated that answer. That was so enlightening. Thank you Thank so much, you. Dr. Dyson. Brother Thank Jay, you. Sister Phoenix, Sister Lena, just, just incredible, just incredible. So we have one last student question for you, and this one comes from Bailey. So Bailey, if you would. Awesome. Thank you so much for speaking to us, uh, Professor Dyson. This has been amazing. Um, I just wanted to ask, in your book, you refer to the killing of Black bodies by cops as the Blue Plague, and you compare um, the recent instances of police brutality um, and COVID-19 as dual pandemics, um, saying that because we were able to see the murdering of George, George Floyd via video, um, it generated sort of a larger impact. Um, do you think that the instances of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, and others in 2020 would have been as impactful and change provoking had they happened outside of COVID-19? And um, what do you think that the impact of this most recent Black Lives Matter movement would have been if social media didn't exist? Wow. Wow. That's that's another great question. That's powerful. Yeah. You know, I think you're right, Miss Bailey. You know, we were all at home, not all of us, but most of us, right, who could afford to, the privileged among us, college students, professors, people who think, right? And we're at home on our contraptions, our devices. We were literally left to our own devices, right? And so we were used to seeing these devices in a way that before COVID wasn't true. 
Look at us now. We're virtual. You know, I would love to be in the same room with Professor Brown, with you, Miss Shaw, with the dean, Brother Jensen, you know, Brother Bruce over there. It, 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 there's a different kind of fleshly familiarity and immediate intimacy of exchange, but we can't do it. And so now we've learned to appreciate what like old people like me were telling young people, hey, get off of that darn phone. Learn to respect the space between us and talk to me. You're, you're texting each other at dinner. I sound like some old dude. Get off my grass, <laughs> right? And now the very thing that was being remonstrated against morally, the very thing we were just haranguing and dogging, we depend on. The very technology that was seen to divide us has now brought us together. People talk to their therapists online. People, people speak to their doctors online. They talk to their loved ones, and some, tragically, spend the last moments of their loved ones' lives on this machine, on this technology. That's not a metric or an algorithm that you can discern. And so I think... With all of us, many of us being home, when the George Floyd murder hit, we felt a kind of identification with him that we might not have felt before COVID. But we were used to, you know, we're we're doing what's that uh, app, the one where you could put the whiskers on and the Snapchat, Snapchat, right? You know, we were used to embellishing the digital representation. The digital trace bore the mark of our creative engagement because we were going to leave our mark on you too. And we were going to play with that technology. So that technology has allowed us to become much more intimate in a way that beforehand we thought was a division and an erasure. So I think you're right that when we saw George Floyd and we saw him die, it struck us in a way. It felt personal because I'm used to seeing my kids. I'm used to seeing my uncle. I'm used to seeing my mama. That's how we talk now. He felt like one of the family. Like, what do you, hey, what, hey, stop. The dude is begging for breath, stop. And all the asterisks that usually accompany black bodies like a toe tag, right? When they are cadavers. Well, he was, he was threatening. No, he wasn't. Everybody saw he, he's on the ground, prostrate. He's a six foot six, six foot seven black man. You can even take measure of his of impressive stature because he's on the ground. Then, then, then we said, we would say, well, he was running. Clearly not. Oh, he was being belligerent and, and sir, officer, sir, officer, right? Even as he's dying, he's really showing his home training. And then calling his mama broke the hearts of many. So I think the technology mediated in, in that way, if we can talk about it that way, uh, an awareness and an intimacy that heretofore we had not been used to. So yes, it made a big difference. And the syndemic, the convergence of pandemics, the synthesis of pandemics, COVID-19, COVID-16, 19, call it that if you want, right? Slavery in the beginning. So, yes, you're absolutely right. And to answer your question, would it have been the same Black Lives Matter without social media? Probably not. Because in one sense, the death of Trayvon Martin was essentially mediated through social media, to be redundant. Sorry, Marshall McLuhan. So the point is, that, that it became a spectacle. And it had to be a spectacle first in order to draw attention. Al Sharpton gets involved because of social media. People hit me up. Why aren't you talking about Trayvon Martin? Who's Trayvon Martin? And I was literally in Florida at the All-Star game the weekend he was murdered. Right? So social media created the demand to address Trayvon. And then finally, George um, was arrested. Finally, 
after all of that pressure being brought to bear. And Black Lives Matter is born out of the fact that this man was acquitted for the murder of Trayvon Martin. So the known etiology of the organism of Black resistance, the known origin of that particular uh, powerful expression uh, was Trayvon Martin traced back to social media that forced it is to become a, a national issue. And I'll end by saying, look, what about if Martin, if Martin Luther King Jr. had had Instagram? I'm out here posting up down in Selma. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. King had a, had a sense of humor, so don't get upset with me, y'all. Don't get upset with me. He had far more aggressive humor than I'm exhibiting here tonight. Trust and believe. So, you know, imagine Dr. King tweeting, join us in Washington on August 28th, 1963. And I'm going to give a speech. I'm going to post some of it right here. Tell me what you think. <laughs> so he ran a, I have a, oops, sorry. Y'all come to the speech. Check out what it is. So the thing is, yes, your brilliant point is without social media, the contours wouldn't have been the same. Now we had SNCC, the Black Lives Matter of their day, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, leaderless movements, right? Or leaderful, Julian Bond, John Lewis, Diane Nash, James Bevel, right? Um, Marion Barry and the like, tremendous. So they, they, Bob Moses, they took advantage of the system and did brilliantly creative things then. But with social media, the immediacy of it, the impact of it, the registering immediately of what we believe and see uh, is in this sense an advantage. I would argue in other instances it's a grave disadvantage, like people trying to, you know, think about it before you get mad at somebody and try to cancel them on social media. And then you you mad and trying to beat them up and, and bring a digital lynch mob to bear when if you cool down a little bit, you could see a different perspective. But that's my personal pet peeve. Uh, but to answer your question, absolutely, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. So we are at that point where we um, will pause our conversation, I think, Professor Dyson, because we hope to be in conversation with you again many times and bring you to ASU and, uh, and the Valley of the Sun. Um, what you have said for, with us tonight, what you've imagined, you have a, a quote in your book where you talk about imagination as a tool of self-defense. Mm -hmm. um, and through long time coming, you really underscore that imagination can be recuperative, that it can restore, and that it can shine a light and mm -hmm. give us a way to um, recover both history and the future. Um, so we have been honored to be in your company. Uh, anyone who wants to watch this brilliant conversation again uh, can find it on the ASU English Department uh, YouTube uh, page. So we encourage you to go there. And uh, just want to end with some words of thanks, uh, certainly to the English department, to the creative writing program, uh, to the writing program, to the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Um, and thanks very much to Brutes Masanaga and Kristen LaRue. Um, hope that everybody joins us again in March uh, for the next Tomorrow Talks uh, with Melinda Gates and our own Aviva Davaiban, uh, Professor of Film and Media Studies. So Professor Dyson, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Brown, for this extraordinary opportunity and for your beautiful and brilliant uh, interlocutorship here tonight. Thank you so very kindly. All right. Thank you.